All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's presentation, Digital Controller Tuning Part B, ILM 310305DB. Uh, this one's a bit of a doozy. If you had a look at it already, uh, you'll see there's quite a bit of stuff in here to wrap your brain around. Um, but ultimately what we're trying to get you to do here is understand uh, processes and the effects of different disturbances on a process and then ultimately how um, we end up uh, adjusting uh, our tuning uh, theory, I guess, in order to uh, accommodate different processes uh, in regards to results that we want to see in terms of performance from a control loop. So the objectives uh, look really simple. Uh, calculate the controller settings for a control loop, which really isn't too bad. Uh, determine the controller mode selection and initial settings for various control loops. So if we read these, it sounds uh, like it should be relatively simple. Uh, and I'm going to try to keep it that way for you, if I can, um, a lot of this, a lot of words in the ILM that really boil down to uh, not too much. Um, if you did the labs, and I'm assuming that you did do the tuning labs, uh, you've already done the calculating controller settings for a control loop. Uh, there's five different tuning methods in this ILM. My expectation is that you understand the math for the uh, first two styles of tuning method that is the uh, ultimate gain method and the reaction curve method uh, math wise there's nothing in there that we haven't done already so it, you know involving uh, finding your t1 time your dead time uh, your overall uh, static gain and that kind of thing so we have done most of that math uh, the, the other tuning methods there there's there's definitely other math involved with it um, um, I don't have any expectation for you to be able to actually uh, have to perform that type of math in any type of an exam um, so you can understand kind of uh, how it works. Long story short, as you read through the ILM, we basically go through all five of the different tuning methods, uh, the math associated with these tuning methods, and then it culminates at the end with a comparison uh, of the results of all the calculations that we do for each of the methods, and you'll see um, uh, some of them are quite similar, some of them are uniquely different, and the idea here is that you understand why, uh, why that is and why you would use one style over the other. And it has a lot to do, again, with what type of a response do we want from our process when we're done? How does it react to a disturbance, whether it's a load disturbance or a set point disturbance? And ultimately, that comes down to uh, can I handle... Uh, an under, under damped response, like a quarter amplitude decay response, or do I want something that's more like a first order plus dead time response or a critically damped response that has no overshoot? And that's really what it comes down to in the end. Um, but there's a windy, windy road along the edge of a cliff uh, that we have to walk before we uh, get to that point. So most of the stuff we're gonna talk about today is based off this um, steam exchanger. Uh, example that we've been looking at in the in the ILM there. So we'll talk a lot about the process variable, uh, the manipulated variable, uh, and the effects of different uh, disturbances, uh, load wise and set point wise. Okay, so some things we have to understand um, before we get going here is first of all, how did disturbance affect the loop? Then we have to understand uh, how the process reacts. So we do this. Uh, we can figure this out by doing a test. And we've talked in a previous lecture about doing loop tests or bump tests. Uh, so these two points kind of uh, speak to the bump test kind of uh, portion of it. Then the third point here is uh, we have to determine if the equipment is operating properly. Um, we've got to make sure that all the individual components are operating properly before we can try to get them to work together as a team. So that's important for us to understand. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the type of response we want needs to be considered. So do we want a, a quarter amplitude decay response or do we want something that comes up nice and finds our set point uh, a little slower but uh, more accurately? And then ultimately, um, out of the five tuning methods that are in this ILM, what tuning method uh, do you want to use or what works best? Uh, and there's tables at the end that help us figure this out. So. Um, it won't be too bad once we get through all of the theory here. 
So first of all, we're going to look at disturbances. And there are three types as identified in the ILM here. The first one is called a transient disturbance. Uh, this is a temporary disturbance, uh, such as a dip in the steam supply, uh, which would re recover relatively quickly. So transient means it comes and goes um, relatively quickly. Second type of disturbance is a load disturbance, which would be an increase or decrease. Uh, in the example of the steam exchanger, a uh, change in the feed flow uh, would be a load to be a load change and it has a, a different dynamic uh, in terms of how it affects the process when we compare it to the third one which is a set point uh, disturbance uh, which of course results from a set point change. The main commonality between all three of these things here is that they all are disturbances and in all of these situations we want to have a loop that remains stable and recovers from any type of upset like this. So then we want to know what does recovery look like? Uh, so we're going to look at three, uh, really quickly here, three classifications of process responses. So the first one is a self-regulating response, and this is a little bit of a review. The second one is an integrating response, and the third is a runaway response. Um, none of uh, these ones are particularly what we're really after, but we just want to make sure that we're clear on understanding uh, these before we get going, because these are really uh, ones that we don't want to deal with here. So just to review again, self-regulating process uh, finds a new steady uh, process variable after the controller output steps. So this would be like the temperature of the uh, heating oil or something like that. We need a, a step in our uh, controller output and uh, we let an X amount more steam. That amount of steam has the capability of heating the oil up X number of degrees and no, no more. So the, the resulting graph would look something like we see here on the, on the screen. So it self-regulates, it finds a new happy place after the, after the disturbance. Integrating response again ramps at a rate proportional to the step change. Uh, it will ramp to uh, the limit without reaching a new steady state. And in manual, this can be uh, very, very bad. And we learned that earlier as well. Runaway, very similar to uh, the integrating response. It will ramp to a limit, but it's a little bit different is that in that it will speed up or the slope. If I was to draw a line here uh, and the line here, you'll see that the, uh, the process reaction speeds up as it goes. Uh, and this is sometimes called a non-linear integrating uh, process and this is uh, an example of a reaction or a reactor here where the reaction kind of starts out slow and then builds and builds and builds it's just like building a campfire it starts out very small and then grows into a large raging campfire so that's a good example of a, uh, a non-linear integrating or a runaway process so those are uh, four potential bad outcomes uh, that we could be looking at uh, before we get into this, I, I'm not sure if this is in the ILM anymore, but I want to make sure we understand this, that we're dealing basically with four standard loop components when we're, when we're dealing with tuning an entire uh, loop. The first being the controller, the second is the final control element, the third is the process, and the fourth is the measuring instrument. And we talked about equipment and everything being working properly before uh, we get into tuning because if any of these individual things aren't working properly we're not going to get it uh, a good tune it's just like a car uh, if you've got a bad muffler or bad carburetor or um, bad head gasket or anything like that if any of your individual components aren't working good chances are you're not going to get the maximum performance out of it so in order for the loop to function properly all of these components must be functioning optimally as well so how do we know uh, if these things are functioning well? To test the health of the loop, we perform a bump test. And we've looked at bump tests earlier, I think. Uh, and the resulting grasp, uh, graph we get from a bump test will tell us a lot uh, about the process loop. Um, accuracy is one thing, but consistency is also uh, another one of the things that we look for. Uh, we can deal with some inaccuracies as long as we know that they're consistent. And this kind of goes back to uh, accuracy versus repeatability, but uh, hopefully you have both. But we want to make sure that when we make changes in a bump test that it re responds uh, repeatable. Okay, so here let's look at the bump test procedure in order to do a bump test. Okay, uh, 
bump testing again is the way we check the baseline performance of the loop. Um, when we're doing open loop tuning, we're only checking the, the dynamics of the process. Um, but when we're in closed loop, we're, we're taking in kind of everything here. So um, here's what a bump test looks like in a couple of examples. So first we do, uh, we put the controller in manual. We kind of let it settle out so it's all happy. And then we'll make small changes to the controller output, uh, both up and down, uh, waiting in between each step for the PV to reach steady state. And the PV hopefully will go up and down about the same amount each time. So here's an example of a good uh, self-regulating bump test. Here we have the controller output steady state. We make a 10% uh, change in our controller output. We have a little bit of dead time. And then we get a first order response uh, equaling 10%. Uh, here uh, and it and it levels out and is is pretty good. So we like that bump. That looks pretty good. We step down. Uh, we have more or less equivalent dead time to our step up. It ramps down in a similar way. Finds a happy point. We step down again. It does the same thing. Basically, we step up. It does the same thing. Uh, same thing uh, again. So again, dead time, first order time, constant. Uh, and each of these step changes is pretty well consistent. We call that a good bump test. Uh, for an integrating bump test, uh, it's a little bit different again. And if we went back to the theory on uh, integrating and reset wind up, uh, we know that we, when we make a step change up in an integrating process, it will continue to uh, it'll continue to ramp up based on uh, the output level. When we ramp down, it will continue to ramp up until we come back down below our previous set point, which occurs here, at which point it will ramp uh, down the other way and find a happy place. At any rate, um, the idea here is that we see consistent responses to our change. Um, I'm not too interested in um, being able to identify whether this one's a self-regulating or this is an integrating. They're just both good examples of what we are kind of looking for in a bump test. So uh, here's another diagram showing a not good uh, bump test here. And this one is specific, specifically speaking to a, an issue called valve stiction. Uh, and valve stiction is excessive friction on the valve stem, which causes uh, incomplete or choppy movements. Uh, this is often caused by tight packing, the wrong packing, uh, a bad pitted stem or something like that. But there are other issues that can be identified in the bump test, uh, such as a leaking diaphragm or uh, other things of that, of that nature here. Um, but if we looked at the graph, just to wrap our heads around it a little bit, uh, if we compared it to the previous one, we made that 10% step change. We had that little dead time. It went up to its uh, happy spot about 10%. And we we're saying, well, that looks pretty good. But then I take a 10% step back down again, and you'll see my process variable only comes down about half of that uh, and levels out. I do another 10% step down, and you see it does a really, really, really big change. So what happens here is the valve doesn't close as much as it should. Then we reduce our controller output signal again, and all of a sudden it lets go, and it changes a whole bunch. Uh, and then we do a step up, and then it comes back up again, and this is about a 15% change. So there's not much consistency here uh, at all, except for that initial point where we open the valve. So it can tell us a lot about what's going on in the process. If we um, looked at this in a little bit uh, closer uh, view, and if you did the valve, uh, the valve lab, the setting the DVC on the valve and doing uh, doing the stroke check uh, and the valve signature, it would look more like this. <clears throat> and the the controller here uh, is increasing pressure to the valve where the valve should be linearly following this curve, it doesn't. It increases pressure to a point where suddenly the valve does a jump, and then it increases again, and then it does a jump, and then it increases again, and then it does a jump. Uh, and this is, uh, um, this is what the valve signature would look like for, for valve stiction. Um, so this is, again, something that we don't really want. So what does optimal performance look like? Um, to, for us to achieve it, we have to balance three different things. That is the performance of the controlled variable, which is the oil temperature in our, in our oil exchanger process. Uh, we have to balance the robustness of the loop, which is the stability, which means how much upset can it tolerate and still be able to uh, control things. 
And then also the third thing is the performance of the manipulated variable, in this case, the steam flow loop. Um, it's one thing to have our control variable on, on point and our loop being relatively stable, but we also don't want our manipulated variable, uh, our steam valve to be wildly oscillating all of the time. So there is a balance between uh, these things here in, a, in what we define as an optimally performing loop. And you probably will never get all three of these exactly perfect, but again, the idea is to find a balance between them. So if we look at a controlled variable response, okay, so this is a controlled variable response, so our process variable. When we make a set point change, what does the process have to do? What can we tolerate? Uh, there are many criteria defining a good controlled variable response type. So what do we want it to do? Um, three things that we have to consider uh, are include the specified decay ratio. So this has to do with what kind of a wave we get out of it. Uh, the second one is a minimum interval of absolute error, which is a, a measurement of the amount of time we spend in a non-happy spot. And the third thing we have to consider is zero overshoot or a first order response. So we can have a number of different things and there's different levels of tolerance uh, for them. So let's just quickly touch on each one of these points. Okay, so here is an example of the specified decay ratio. And when we talk about specified decay ratio, the common one uh, in industry is the quarter amplitude decay. Uh, and quarter amplitude decay simply means that the size of the second peak is a quarter of the size of the first peak. And to figure that out, you just do A2 over A1, and that would give you a ratio. Now, theoretically, we go for a quarter, but it could be a third, or it could be a fifth, or it could be a half. Um, what distinguishes this is the fact that it does overshoot our set point, and it does come underneath our set point uh, at least one time usually uh, and in some process that processes that's acceptable in other processes that is not acceptable so that is something that we have to consider the second one here is the minimal integral of absolute error which is a little bit out there uh, which is essentially compiling the accumulated error error as shown in the graph uh, and the total is an indication of the response so smaller number means that it spends less time leveling out and didn't have as much amplitude Therefore, it's more robust. It means it wasn't an error zone for as long. Uh, the, the minimum amount of time spent in the error zone means that the loop is more robust. It's, it's a measure of how long the upset exists, and generally, less is better. So it's a measurement of, uh, of all this time that we're not flatlined here where we want to be. So in a first order response, it's all this area uh, in a uh, you know, quarter amplitude decay type of one, it's all of these uh, different areas. And again, the less the less time we spend in our non-happy area, the more robust our, our loop is. The last criteria here is called zero overshoot or our over damped response. Um, this is lots of times a good, a good example. The only the downside to this compared to a quarter amplitude decay uh, is that it's not as fast. Uh, it hasn't got any overshoot or undershoot, but it is it is slower. So again, different responses will fit different process applications. So zero overshoot, the PV goes right to the set point. Uh, it can be qualified by its 63.2% time or its T1 time. And we have critically damped, which is uh, as fast as it can get up there without going over. And then we have over damped, which is a little bit uh, less a uh, little bit less uh, severe here. So again, this is a choice. You might want to have uh, decay instead. It's, it's up to you. Uh, but these are things that we need to understand and, and be able to determine what we actually want. So we talk about robustness, uh, and we'll define it here quickly. The uh, robustness is the ability of a control loop to remain stable when the process changes. It's the equivalent uh, of a human being uh, being able to uh, handle the stress and changes of a job. Um, and when we're talking about a control loop, it's all about gain and phase 
angle. Uh, remember a, a few lectures ago, uh, we did some math and we said that we always wanted to have a gain of one and phase shift uh, less than 180. And what this does uh, was it ensures that our oscillation amplitude uh, does not increase and that we managed to get uh, we managed to get to a steady state eventually. Uh, if it's more than 180 degrees, uh, you end up chasing your tail kind of thing, if you remember that. So the terms that we are going to discuss, that we're going to use to define robustness, and this is a little bit out there, um, but again, this is kind of background theory, uh, so you can understand what the effects of your tuning will be in the future. So we measure uh, robustness by these two factors here, and there's a little chart coming up next that uh, I'll show you really briefly, but um, it, the, I can't really capture everything in this PowerPoint that's written in the ILM, but let's just do what we need to do here. Okay, so the gain margin is how much a nonlinear loop gain can change without becoming unstable. And remember, as we operate through a loop, most of them are not linear, and we tune it generally for uh, a particular operating range. So outside of that operating range, we could have problems, and that is an effect of this gain margin. Uh, the higher the gain margin, the more robust we have, the uh, more robustness we have. Phase margin, same kind of idea. Um, it is a measure of the apparent dead time of a process. And again, a higher margin is better. So we're talking about a margin of error, whether it's gain or phase, how much tolerance do we have for an upset in any in either this scenario, the gain scenario, or the phase scenario. Uh, and again, larger is better. So let's look at what the ILM says here. So uh, some fancy software generates a plot as shown before uh, below here in this graph. And this indicates boundaries for the tuning parameters. So uh, as we look at this graph here, basically the higher number, number one, two, three, and four here, indicate more uh, robust loops. Uh, this chart here uh, relates to the numbers uh, over here and you can see uh, as our gain margin increases and our phase margin increases these these numbers uh, increase as well. So in this graph here number four would be the most tolerant um, setting that we have and number one would be the least tolerant setting that we have here uh, and and going just by the settings uh, that are associated with this gain margin phase margin combination here, we can get these different types of loop responses. So down here, number one here will give us a, a quarter amplitude type of response. Uh, number two, which has a high gain margin but a low phase margin, will give us a, a little bit more damped version of a quarter amplitude decay. Um, number three, with a low gain margin but a high phase margin gets us to our set point but not quite as fast because we have less of a gain margin and then number four is kind of the ideal one here which gives us this uh, under damped uh, relatively slow moving uh, response here so this is far more robust meaning that it's not all wonky uh, and less robust mean indicated by the fact that it is a little bit more wonky uh, that's a technical term uh, that we use to describe the, the output graph here. Manipulated variable. So second subject here, those were controlled variable issues. These are manipulated variable issues now. Uh, when we make a set point change, what does the process have to do? What do we have to tolerate? So same ideas, same considerations. Uh, we figured out that for the controlled variable, uh, and there were several different choices, uh, manipulated variable response is a little bit more particular. Okay, anything other than an overdamped response could spell trouble for the equipment down the line. Uh, remember in our example here, where our manipulated variable is the steam flow. Uh, we're taking steam for our portion of the plant off of a header uh, that feeds other areas in the plant. So if we're constantly increasing and decreasing the demand on steam from our area it's going to affect things downstream or become a disturbance for those downstream so we want to uh, make sure that when we make changes that we're not causing any major deviations uh, read no quarter amplitude decay it's bad here when we make a manipulated variable change we want it to be smooth 
and consistent so that we don't have any major problems uh, affecting downstream uh, processes. So to determine the optimal response, we have to evaluate the entire system, uh, including downstream effects. So if you're in a, uh, a multi-train plant where you've got, you know, uh, three exact same plants all being fed off the same steam header um, or, or the output of your portion of uh, the facility is being fed to another portion of the facility. Yours has to be working right, otherwise it's going to affect everything down the line. It's just like work. If you don't do your job properly and efficiently, uh, the guy that has to do the next step will have a more difficult time doing it. So we have to we have to be considerate of a number of different things before we even get into tuning. And uh, although this was a brief kind of whirlwind overview of these things, it gives you a general theoretical understanding of things that you probably have uh, an, a kind of innate understanding uh, just through your work experience. So this gets us into uh, the chunkier portion of this ILM and what it really, uh, really is intended to focus on in terms of the uh, objectives is tuning methods. So uh, there are many, many tuning methods. We, in my opinion, look at too many. Um, the most common one that we use nowadays is not even mentioned in the ILM and that's auto-tune. Um, but there are five here in the ILM in order to keep us going. Um, Ziegler-Nichols Ultimate Gain and Ziegler-Nichols Reaction Curve, these are the two examples that we did in our lab exercises. And if you did these two in your lab as you were supposed to, the rest of this section shouldn't be too bad. Um, I personally am not working you guys over in terms of math on anything except for these first two methods. There is a lot of math, a lot of formulas associated with all of these uh, different tuning methods, but my focus in terms of testing um, is only gonna focus on the Ziegler and Nichols ones here. And the reason I've done that is because um, we have done all the math for this stuff in previous uh, subjects and previous exercises. Uh, and the purpose of putting these all together here is more of a comparative uh, analysis than it is in becoming a master uh, of all of these different uh, methods. Okay, so there's too many choices, of course, five different ones here. So to help us decide which method would work best somebody has come up with a way of saying well how how can i tell what method i should use and they came up with something called an uncontrollability factor and what an uncontrollability factor is is simply a measurement comparison between the loop's dead time to its first order time constant so in this case here the loop's dead time is 0.77 minutes and the loop's t1 constant here is 0.73 minutes we do a comparison of these and we end up with a number of 1.1. File this in the back of your memory because we do talk about it a little bit, but we don't actually apply it in the ILM uh, on any of the exercises that we do. But do understand that it exists and it is a tool that you can use in order to, uh, in order to decide what tuning method uh, that you're going to use should you ever have to uh, pick one uh, if your auto tune is broken. Okay, so we'll look uh, first at the Ziegler Nichols uh, closed loop turning meth tuning method, also known as the ultimate gain method. And this is a method we've done in the lab. I am just going to quickly review uh, the process as it's outlined in the ILM, because again, uh, you should have done this already. Um, so uh, put the controller in manual, set the controller output so the PV will settle down at its uh, happy spot, whatever it happens to be, and it doesn't matter if there's a bias between these two numbers, it's kind of irrelevant. Then you set your controller to P only, uh, which means that you have to turn off your integral or your derivative, and in the lab we just set those values to zero. We then set the static gain or the gain of the controller to the starting values for your process type, which you have no idea of uh, at this point in time, uh, but it, 
by the time we get to the end of this lecture, you will have an idea of what your starting points are for your process type. And when I talk about process type, I mean is it a liquid uh, pressure loop, a gas pressure loop, a flow loop, a temperature loop, a level loop, whatever it is. Uh, as we move further in the ILM here, you'll see that there's baseline values uh, for all of these different types of process. Okay, so uh, get rid of your integral and derivative, set your controller to P only, set the gain to the starting value for your process type, and then switch it over to automatic. Apply a 10% step, step, step change to the set point and observe the process variable. If the response does not oscillate or if the oscillations decay, we increase the gain by half until we end up getting to sustained oscillations. So this is how we, uh, we get that nice uh, sine wave graph with all the equal peaks. Uh, again, so if we started out with a gain value of, uh, let's say, 1, and we didn't get oscillations, then we'd increase it to 2. If we didn't get oscillations, we'd increase it to 4. If we didn't get oscillations, we'd increase it to 8. If 8 got us uh, up to oscillations that were uh, too high, we would come back down to 6, and then, you know, kind of hone it in from there, taking uh, what I call half steps, whether they're half steps up or... Uh, or half steps down or double steps up, whichever way uh, you need to do. But the idea is to hone in to a point where you get those sustained oscillations, which again, uh, by definition, uh, have about 2% decay maximum. Ideally, we're looking for something that looks relatively consistent. Once we have that wave, uh, the period peak to peak uh, becomes our ultimate period, which is why we call this the ultimate gain method, because it is ultimately that gain that created our uh, oscillations. So our oscillations, again, should look like this. We go peak to peak, we end up getting our PU. That's one of the variables we need to apply to the chart for a Ziegler-Nichols uh, ultimate gain method. The other, uh, the other thing we need to apply to the chart in order to get our PID calculations is the ultimate gain. The ultimate gain is simply the number that we entered into the machine that, oops, shoot, the number that we entered into the machine that got us to here. So let's say it was six, whatever it was. This is doing it via the test. Now, uh, something I need to tell you is that if you're in an operating plant, you're probably not going to be able to do this. Somebody is going to be rather upset if the controller output and this process variable is going up and down all day, especially those guys downstream. So it's not always possible to do it this way. There is an alternative way uh, using math and uh, a, a decaying style output graph here where we can find our decay ratio. Fancy formula down here, decay ratio, uh, which is the same as finding our decay ratio before, B over A, and then plunking it into uh, this formula here. Um, you could be asked uh, to do this calculation here. Um, these formulas are in the formula sheet that's provided in course content. You are allowed to use that for exams. Uh, the tables for tuning are also in the formula sheet, which you are available uh, is available for exams. So uh, fair game in my mind. Okay, at any rate, what we're, what we're finding out here um, is uh, two, var two variables, our ultimate period and our KCU. So this is the way we did it in the lab. This is the way you can do it mathematically if you need to. Once we get those two variables, we add them into our formula here. So um, we apply them to the chart based on the question and pay attention to questions as uh, they uh, um, reveal themselves into, in future exams and worksheets. The question will ask you, um, determine the tuning values for a P or a PI or a PID controller using Ziegler-Nichols ultimate gain or Ziegler-Nichols uh, reaction curve or IMC or Lambda or whatever it happens to be. Make sure you know what the question is asking you for. Uh, I think a majority of them kind of are in the PI area. So uh, just to review what you have to do, if, you're, if the question asks, what are, their, uh, what are the tuning parameters for a PI controller uh, using Ziegler-Nichols, you're going to take your KCU, 
let's say we calculated a six, six times 0.45, it's gonna give us a number. That's what we're gonna enter into the controller for our proportional gain setting. We're gonna take our ultimate period that we calculated. Um, I guess we don't have an example there. Um, eight minutes, whatever it is, divided by 1.2, and that's gonna be our integral time that we put into our controller. So that's how we use the, uh, the chart to determine uh, our tuning settings from uh, Ziegler Nichols uh, ultimate gain graph. Okay, it might not be smart or possible to throw your plant into oscillations. This is what I was talking about on a previous slide. So the other, this modified method that I mentioned on the previous slide also uses a KC that supplies a damped oscillation. Um, this was two slides ago, uh, and it looks like this. So here's a quick example of math for that application. Um, what is kind of interesting here is that we just take the ultimate period as the ultimate period. Um, and then we, again, we apply uh, our B over our A, which we got here to get our decay ratio, and then we pump it in there and we get these values. So that is the ultimate gain method. And just so you're just so we're clear, this is a closed loop method. And the reason we know that it's closed loop is because we did it in automatic. This is now the second tuning method or the reaction curve method, Ziegler, uh, Ziegler Nichols. This test is done in manual. So the process is pretty similar. Uh, put the controller in manual, let it stabilize, make a step change in the controller output, and record the value. This will give us a chart uh, like this. We have seen charts like this before where we do a tangent line, uh, we figure out a dead time, we figure out a T1 time. Uh, so this isn't entirely new for us. Uh, what is a little bit new is that they are now asking us uh, for another variable here, which they call ramp rate, uh, which is an indicator of slope. The formula for ramp rate, ramp rate is simply the change in PV over the change in time. So that's not too confusing. Dead time, um, rather than using um, variables that we've used before, they use L here for that. Uh, but this is still dead time. It's the exact same dead time calculation that we've done before. Uh, it's from the intersection of the tangent line and this horizontal line from here to where our change was made. So we get those two values, ramp rate and the dead time, and we apply the values to the chart. So again, based on what type of tuning parameters the question is asking you for, you apply these factors to the calculated variables um, that we got from this graph here. Reaction rate is the steepest slope line that you can draw, as we said earlier. And again, it's subjective. There's you know, going to be a few degrees difference between uh, different people as they draw that line. Dead time, again, uh, between the step change and where we get that intersecting point. Okay, uh, this method um, assumes that the process oscillates at four times the dead time. Don't worry about that, but do, do remember that. Uh, this is valid for integrating and self-regulating processes. This method does not require the plant to oscillate, which is a good thing. So this is a good alternative tuning method for a plant that is in operation. It allows you to gather data based on one single step change, and it doesn't affect uh, a lot of things downstream in bad ways. Okay, we don't have to wait for steady state again, which is also good. Uh, the response will provide quarter ampl amplitude decay, which may or may not be good depending on your process requirement, as we discussed earlier. Uh, and if your derivative time is less than 0.1 minutes, you're going to use PI only. And you're going to see this statement with every one of these tuning methods. Um, the, the basic statement here is if uh, if the derivative time is less than 0.1, you just don't use it. And you'll see that derivative is not used in a lot of processes. Uh, a general rule is that you're only going to find derivative in slower processes, that is large capacity level processes or uh, large capacity temperature processes. All right, uh, third tuning method here. Uh, and these ones I'm less concerned about the math. Um, but do understand what's going on here. 
uh, relay oscillation tuning is an automated version of the Ziegler Nichols ultimate game method. And you can kind of see that um, by the way it works, uh, by the way it works here. This is kind of the model for most auto tunes that are built into controllers. Uh, and they work basically using a two state relay to control the uh, controller output. And we end up getting a, a graph similar to our Ziegler Nichols ultimate game graph that we use to get our KCU and our PU. If you did auto tune in the lab, and you should have, you would have noticed uh, not quite exactly uh, this. Uh, the waves in the in the lab were not quite as clear and clear cut and square as this, but you would have noticed that they did drive to full level up, full level down, full level up, full level down, full level up, full level down. We get the same values out of it. There is a little bit more of a, a new formula over here. Uh, again, this isn't something that I personally am going to focus on, but um, the formula should be in the formula sheet. And if it is in the formula sheet, uh, I expect that you'd be able to apply it given a graph, for example, something like this. I wouldn't give you, uh, I probably anyway, wouldn't give you a graph like this and say, figure out what A is, figure out what D is, um, figure out what this number is. I would just give you all the data that you require and uh, be able to uh, expect you to be able to determine what it is that we're talking about and what formula is relevant for that one. Okay, key points for relay oscillation tuning here. Uh, we can control the size of the oscillations by varying the step size. Uh, the oscillation should be three times larger than any noise, and we've talked about noise and this three times thing in analyzers. This is just ensuring that we're uh, responding to a real signal. Uh, this works on self-regulating and integrating processes, which kind of covers most processes here. Uh, this can be done manually for slow processes. Uh, and because this relay oscillation, uh, oscillation style changes direction when crossing the process variable, if it is a noisy process variable, it might be tricked to switch by the noise changes. Uh, I don't think I have a good graph that uh, illustrates this. But again, if we have a baseline or a set point that's a horizontal line uh, and, our, uh, and our controlled variable is not as smooth, let's, let's say it's a flow signal, it's got a little bit of that you know jagged kind of edge to it. Even if those jagged edges are very, very small and they're just sitting on top of that set point line, anytime it crosses over and above or down and below, it's a trigger. So we want to make sure that uh, we don't have that situation, or at least that we accommodate for that situation. And that's why we pick three times larger than what we would get from any noise signal. Their fourth uh, tuning method here is IMC, or internal model control tuning. And you'll see I'm probably going to talk less and less about these as we move forward here. Uh, this is a process model built into the controller. And the controller response is compared to this model internally. So there's not a lot here for us to do. Uh, that's why it's called internal model controller. Uh, it works well on processes that have excessive dead time. Tuning method is based uh, on this format and can be used for PID controllers. Similar to Lambda, which we haven't covered yet, we will need an open loop test to work from and to find a transfer function, which we'll see this process in the next couple of slides here. Okay, so the variables that we have to find out in order to do this type of tuning, uh, the integral time, the dead time, and the gain. Uh, some of them are easier than others. So the uh, integral time is simply our T1 time. And remember, we're looking at a, oops, at a first or a open loop graph. So this type of a graph here. And remember, I just said it's similar to Lambda, which, uh, which this is. Um, so the T1 time we find just like we normally do, our uh, derivative time is found by taking our, our dead time and dividing it by two. So again, this dead time value here, dividing it by two. And our gain is a little bit trickier. Uh, we take our T1 time and then do a little bit of uh, funky math using uh, this formula here to find TF. And again, I don't expect you guys to uh, have to do this more than once. I'm not going to be testing you uh, on this map, although it would not be unfair because 
theoretically, uh, the numbers would be there and you just have to exercise the formula. Uh, TF, uh, again, probably filling brain cells that you don't need to fill with this information, but TF uh, is a user-defined filter time similar to TC and Lambda, which again, we haven't discussed. Higher numbers mean it's more robust. Um, it uses a table ultimately. You can see to, to find this TF, it's simply uh, a factor that we apply to something that we've got from the graph. So don't be overwhelmed by all of these different variables out there. Uh, I know I was speaking with uh, one of you earlier and you're a little bit blown away by all the math in here. And I agree, it, it's a little bit much, um, but ultimately it's based off of a couple of things, the dead time and the T1 time, and then just some formulas that are kind of unique uh, to their individual processes. So you can use, uh, so you can use this, and the, the only thing that really changes is um, the variables and, and the table here. So again, not focusing too much on uh, these last three tuning styles. Lambda tuning, uh, very similar to reaction curve when we're doing the calculations, also very similar to IMC, which we just discussed. This is used for PI only. Uh, and the basic theory behind this one here is we uh, get our graph from our test, and then we fill in a transfer function. Uh, and we've done this many, many times before, so this is nothing new to you. Uh, we get our KP by doing change in output over input. We get our dead time, just like we did before. We get our T1 time, just like we did before. So nothing, uh, nothing super crazy going on here. Then we can figure out our other variables. So our integrating time is gonna equal T1. And then we apply some other variables based on certain criteria. So uh, again, as you read through the ILM, you'll see that there's a couple things that we have to do. Um, we find our um, first step, we do this, and then we have to determine, uh, we have to do a little calculation here to find this variable TC, which tells us one of two paths, basically. Um, and then we move on to the next step. It does not give you enough information in the ILM to really understand this wholly. Uh, this is more just so that you know it exists out there. Um, and we don't really elaborate this on, on too much at all. Uh, this is probably more confusing than it needs to be. Uh, definitely under explained uh, for us to really be able to understand it. And if they did decide to take the trouble to understand it in, in all its entirety, we would then be engineers. So let's just keep this in our back pocket. So Lambda, this fancy uh, little thing here in industry will generally vary between one and three. And this is just a fact. Uh, the higher number three in this case provides more robustness. And the example uh, kind of walks you through this and then just says, we're gonna use number two. So whatever it is, but uh, again, theory here is more important than practical application. Key points here, uh, this is performed in manual, again, providing a, a open loop type graph, provides a first order response. So that's something that you're gonna look at when we're all done here is which tuning methods provide a quarter amplitude decay response and which tuning methods provide a first order response. And that's really one of the bigger takeaways because you have to know what type of response you want first so that you pick the proper tuning method and that's we mentioned not a long time ago okay you must determine the transfer function from the graph we've done that many many times so that covers the general dirty details of the five different methods mentioned in the ilm the next slide here uh, just goes over again some of the things we need to remember when we're tuning first of all there are many tuning methods five that we looked at here, not including auto-tune. Which one you choose depends more on the process than the method itself. So make sure you choose wisely, make sure you understand uh, what's going on with your particular process. We often tune a loop for one set point and one, particularly, uh, one particular operating point. Outside of that point, the loop may or may not operate properly. And we've talked about uh, things that we can do, adaptive gain strategies, et cetera, that we can use to uh, adapt to that scenario. Design problems, nonlinearities, and equipment issues may restrict the loop from functioning properly. Again, this goes back to the very first 
uh, step here. Make sure all the individual components are working properly before you even try to tune it, because if they're not, you're probably never going to get a successful tune out of it. And lastly, these methods assume a self-regulating first order dead time type process, as it is in most cases in industry where dead time is much smaller than the T1 time. And just to give you a visual here, uh, dead time, this is maybe not the best example. Uh, these ones are relatively comparable, but most times uh, dead time is significantly smaller uh, than the T1 time. Okie dokie. So here I'm going to speed up a little bit if I wasn't going fast enough for you. Um, this is a quick walkthrough of how to do each, excuse me, of the five tuning methods that we've just looked at. So first one here, uh, tuning examples, open loop. Uh, this would be Ziegler Nichols reaction curve style. Um, but the open loop test is used for these three tuning methods. So this is, if you're taking notes, uh, you might want to put open loop tuning methods are these three here. So we use this, this graph to do all of these three tuning styles here. So again, you should know all this by now. Uh, we've done this many different times in many different sections. Okay, so quickly, uh, what do we have to find for reaction curve? Two variables, reaction rate and L, which is our dead time. So first, draw your tangent line, then determine L in minutes. Then we determine our ramp rate by taking uh, the percentage change over uh, an amount of time. This is the slope of the tangent line. And in this case, we have an L of 0.15 minutes. We have a ramp rate uh, change of 9.45% in 0.56 minutes, which gives us 18% per minute. Those are now the two numbers that we need to use. And then it says to get a PI, and again, remember, you got to pick the right row in the chart to get PI, uh, and then apply the variables to it. So for PI, we do uh, our calculations times 0.9, that gives us a KC of 3.3. Uh, our integral time is 3.33 times L, which gives us 0.5 minutes. And again, this is just applying uh, the chart. And again, the charts are in your um, study guide or formula sheet. Lambda example, uh, again, very close to the Ziegler Nichols reaction curve. Draw the tangent line, determine the dead time, determine the first order time constant. Surprise, surprise, they're both the same. Determine the static gain. Again, exercises we've done many, many times. Uh, and then we fill in the first order plus dead time transfer function. Again, we've done this many, many times. So these are all the variables here. Uh, number seven here is a little bit different. And again, I kind of whipped over this when we were talking about it in the theory section. To determine this TC, um, this is just the exercise. It's either over one or, or less than one. In this case, it's less than one. So we use a lambda of two. You're never going to understand this all in its entirety, um, but this is just the way it is. It's not much fun, but we're just, again, applying uh, some values that we've done many, many times into a particular formula. IMC, uh, again, similar. These are all using the exact same graph, if you haven't figured that out yet, and you're going to see why we're doing that in a couple of slides here. Uh, same process, different tuning methods. Uh, let's see what the results look like at the end. So again, same values here. Uh, we use a table to find the settings for, in this case, also PI settings. So just applying the graph uh, or the calculated values that we get from the graphs to the table. Okay, here's what the table looks like. Um, again, use corresponding tables to the tuning methods as, as they present themselves. Now we're moving into the closed loop uh, style tuning here using the same process as open loop examples. We now do the closed loop version in auto. Uh, for this, uh, for the examples here, we're going to assume that the controller gain is five. Uh, remember, this is the gain value or KCU that we used in order to get sustained oscillations. For this method, we need to find the ultimate gain and the ultimate period. How we do that again? Turn off the integral and derivative, put it in auto, adjust the gain until the loop oscillates and record that value as your KCU. Peak to peak time uh, is then going to be your PU. 
and you can if you don't want to oscillate your plant plant you do the little you do the little step change version this little version here uh, that gives you the decay ratio and you can plunk it into the formula blah 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 and get your uh, get your kcu that way uh, from there again you take it to the table so taking values to the table for pi we're going to multiply our kcu by 0.45 that's going to give us our p setting and we're going to take our PU divided by 1.2, and that's going to give us our integral setting. So I know it looks, you know, it looks like there's lots of math here, but it's very, very, very repetitive. Okay, relay tuning. Losing interest yet? Most of you probably are. Uh, follow the procedure in the ILM. Find your PU, which in this case is 0.61 minutes. Find our KCU by applying uh some math and this formula from the table so again uh, this one is four times d over pi times a so d is this number over here a is this number over here you do some math you get 7.3 for your kcu and uh your pu is peak to peak here and then again use the ziegler nichols ultimate gain table in order to find your settings in this case our gain setting is going to be 3.3, and our integral setting is going to be 0.51. All right, so that was a long, bumpy, fast ride and a long bus on a dangerous cliff, but where has it got us? Here's where it's got us. This is a comparison of the results from all of the five different methods on the exact same process. So what did we end up with? Gains of 3.3, 3.4, and 3.3 with these three methods. A gain of 0.29 and 1.5 for these two methods. Integral times of 0 0.51, 0 0.52, 0 0.50 for these three methods. And it's integral value for uh, these two methods of 0.56. So you'll see these three on the top are very, very similar. And these two on the bottom are quite different. Why is the question that you should be asking yourself at this point? Well, the reason for that is these three methods here are going to give you a quarter amplitude response. These two methods are going to give you more of a first order response. And again, this is important because your process may or may not tolerate something downstream. Okay, so this is a nice little, uh, a nice little cheat sheet here. So uh, if I ask you a question, which tuning method of this, 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 or this will give you a quarter amplitude response, you'll know that the two Ziegler nickels and the relay tuning will give you a quarter amplitude response. Lambda and LMC will give you more of a first order response. How can you tell that by looking at this? There is a way, looking at the gain factor here, these are pretty small numbers, which means that the slope of our line is going to be gradual, right? It's going to be gradual. The higher gain we have here, the more aggressive that line is going to be, right? So when you see a higher gain number, you can expect that you're probably going to get oscillations out of it. When you see a lower gain number, you're probably going to see a more first order type curve. And let's see for sure if that's true. Here's what, the, what it looks like in terms um, of actually comparing graphs. So here's our Ziegler-Nichols uh, method or those three tuning methods, the first three higher gains. This is what the response is going to look like. The IMC, a little bit, a little bit different. And the Lambda, a nice first order process as we, as we show here. Lambda, first order, the other three quarter amplitude. And then this IMC is based on the filter value. So this is the responses that we get out of those tuning methods on the exact same process coming, uh, coming down the line. So that's all the very high fact, high theory information on tuning. Now we'll get a little detailed on fine tuning. So this all gets us in the ballpark based on a graph, a test that we've done. Now we have to fine tune. Uh, fine tuning is basically trial and error. So there are some guidelines, and you're going to like this, I think. For PID control, 
only change the P setting. So as you're tuning this, uh, you came up with numbers like uh, 3.3, 3.4, 3.3. You want to tweak this a little bit more, you're going to go uh, 3.4 on this one or 3.2 on this one. You're not going to make big changes. Okay. So for PID control, only change the P setting. For PI control, only change the P setting. For P control, only change the P setting. Okay. Um, make gain changes by a factor of two. Uh, this is a dangerous statement. Um, factor of two can be dangerous. So if it was 0.75 and it was oscillating, try to cut it in half. Chances are you're not going to be in this area after your initial settings. It will probably be pretty close after its initial settings. Um, so make a, make a small change, see what it does, and then you apply the factor of two. Okay, for PID control, uh, if the derivative setting is less than 0.1 minutes, then only use PI. I mentioned that earlier, uh, that you'll probably see this coming down the road. And I think if you read through the individual ones, um, it, it kind of mentions this in each individual one. Uh, so just hammering that home a little bit. If, if the derivative isn't big enough of a number to make a difference, don't use it. It only complicates things. Remember, derivative uh, responds to rate of change, and that is that can be problematic. We talked about derivative kick and all that kind of wonderful stuff. So we tend not to use derivative unless we need it, uh, and that is usually on slower processes, as you will find out shortly. Okay, what is the result of some of our changes? Increasing the gain increases the speed of response, but also makes the loop less stable. Increasing the integral increases our cyclic period or peak to peak times, but also makes the loop less stable. Increasing the derivative will improve stability, but also makes it more susceptible to noise. If your derivative, and you're gonna get this point to you one way or the other, is lower than 0.1, Use PI only. Okie dokie. So the previous examples, all five of them represent average processes. There are times when the process has significant dead time. This is a specific situation that we're talking about here. And the tuning parameters will be different. Uh, this is defined by the uncontrollability parameter. And remember, we're talking about dead time here. So it comes into that formula uh, that we've uh, used earlier that uncontrollability parameter here. Um, this was the calculation based uh, on all the examples that we've looked at so far, which ended up with a UP of 0.26. Um, if we looked at one that has significant dead time, uh, for example, this one here, the, you'll see the, the dead time and the D1 time are very close together, uh, whereas this one here, the dead time is only about a quarter uh, of our T1 time. Um, we have to do uh, a little bit different things here uh, if you get into this type of application. Everything else is the same, but the final values are going to differ. Uh, let's see what that looks like. Okay, so here's the results uh, from the previous, uh, all the previous examples of calculations that we've done. Uh, and then this is what it looks like when we have significant dead time. Um, I've skipped all the math here. You guys, of course, are going to have to read it. Um, but this is just to uh, show you that there can be significant differences in our tuning values uh, on processes that have um, different uh, or significant dead time uh, values here. All right. <clears throat> this gets us into the control loop guidelines or baseline settings that we mentioned earlier, where to start. Flow, uh, we've got about 10 more slides here to go, so I know this seems a little bit long. Uh, I could use a break right now, but for the sake of online learning and the fact that you guys are probably at work, we're going to keep motoring along here. Um, flow, liquid pressure, gas pressure, level, and temperature. These are the most common process types, and with dealing with each category, the control methods are similar amongst them. Um, but we need to be able to understand the individuality or the individual characteristics of these processes. And as we move forward here, we want to pay attention to similarities between processes like uh, flow, gas pressure, liquid pressure, and differences. 
uh, trying to get you a, a, a general understanding of what makes them similar and what makes them different. Okay, oops, sorry, flow and liquid pressure. Okay, so we're going to talk about these two combined, and there's a reason for that. Flow and liquid pressure have the following traits. They are fast-acting, self-regulating processes. Changes are almost instantaneous. The process dynamic gain is close to one, so the controller gain must be less than one. Um, I know this is hard to put into your brain right now because you can't really wrap your head around it or compare it to anything, um, but it is, it is what it is. So uh, bedtime and first order time constant are just about the same. So the unpredict unpredictability or uncontrollability parameter is nearly one. Uh, turbulent flow is noisy, so a process variable is also noisy. These are all facts. I, there's no gentle way to bring this out to you. Okay, so we need a low gain. This means that we're going to have offset if we're using only P only control. So to fix that, we add some integral, which is again there to remove offset. The process is noisy and fast, so rate action or derivative should not be used. PI control is recommended. Okay. Uh, and, uh, as we move forward into the other process types, uh, we're going to be comparing some standard things here. And all these numbers here at the bottom, scan rate, uh, filtering, P settings, I settings, uh, this is what you want to pay attention to as we associate them with specific process types. So again, flow and liquid pressure, very similar to each other. So they have similar uh, settings. PI control is recommended. Scan rate of about 0.2 seconds. Transmitter filtering uh, is about half uh, of the scan rate. This is just a fact. Typical settings. Uh, you might want to set yourself a little matrix uh, for these as we move along here. Uh, gain setting of about 0.3 in the range of 0.2 to 0.8. Integral setting of 0.1 uh, with the range of 0.02 to 0.25. And you might use lambda tuning uh, for a first order plus dead time or no overshoot type reaction for this type of process. Okay, we're going to look at the next process in the same light as this. So gas pressure, a uh, little bit of variation here, three different applications, vessel pressure, reactor pressure, and furnace pressure. Uh, they are a little bit different uh, and have slightly different characteristics and control methods. Okay, so vessel back pressure is a self-regulating process with a large first order time constant compared to the dead time. Again, it takes time, it takes time to charge up pressure, right? Uh, this gives us a small unpredictability parameter. I know I don't say unpredictability all the time, uncontrollability parameter, which makes it easy to control. Reaction speed may be fast or slow depending on vessel size. Remember T1. Uh, is associated with a single capacity process and is related to the capacity or the size of the vessel. Noise is not an issue uh, typically with pressure problems, uh, pressure uh, processes. We can use high gains if offset is not a concern. If it is, we'll throw some integral in there. Okay, scan rate 0.2. You're going to see that the same for all of the ones that we're looking at. Filtering. 0.5, you're going to see that for all of the processes that we're looking at. What is going to change is whether we use P, I, P only, I only, D only, blah, 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 and what the baseline settings are here. So again, back pressure is a, um, a little bit slower, meaning it's got a large T1 timer. It takes a large, a large amount of time to, to get to its set point, so we're going to have a higher gain. In this case, gain setting of 5, integral setting uh, of 5 uh, and a range here of 0.5 to 20 and 1 to 10. These are the numbers that you're concerned about. Again, I would encourage you to make yourself a little matrix, uh, process type, gain setting, integral type, uh, gain setting, integral setting, derivative setting, if it applies, uh, what the recommended value is, what the range is. Furnace pressure, uh, self-regulating process with a large first order time constant. Again, uh, tight control is required with furnace pressure. Uh, so it has a small, small span 
uh, which makes it quick and has a high gain. That small span also causes noise. Uh, it'll react like an integrating system. The process variable and set point must try to be very close in order to maintain efficiency. So proportional integral control with the integral on error and the P on the process variable to reduce kick, all with the goal of keeping us really close to our uh, set point for this furnace pressure application. Again, 0.2.5 aren't going to change. Uh, PV dampening for noise, use reacting curve method for tuning uh, and getting your baseline values. Reactor pressure uh, characteristics here, again, self-relating process with large first order time constant. Tight control required, again, just like furnace pressure, uh, reacts like an integrating system. Uh, again, this is very similar to furnace pressure. Uh, use PI, uh, in this case, with set point softening to present, prevent overshoots. Scan rate's the same, filtering is the same, PV dampening for noise, uh, reacting curve method for baseline, and then cut in half for robustness. Um, I'm not going to be able to uh, talk to all of these individual points. Level control, uh, this is distinctly different here. Again, so we talked about uh, gas pressure, we talked about liquid pressure and flow, which were similar, gas pressure, which was uh, similar, and the level control, uh, a little bit different here. Two different types with two different strategies. The first one is tight control, second one is surge control. Tight control, of course, as the name uh, implies here, tries to keep the uh, PV and set point. Uh, near to each other to protect equipment or product quality, whereas surge control uh, reduces variations in inflow and outflow without overfilling or running dry. Uh, we're not worried how accurate it is. It can basically go from nearly full to nearly empty. Major deviations are okay. The idea is we just don't want to run out of uh, a liquid that's feeding a pump, probably for a good example. So they do have different tuning um, requirements obviously if one's tight and one is not. So tight control, integrating process, large first order time constant, reaction speed may be fast or slow again based on vessel size, noise may be an issue if it's turbulent. Uh, for tight control you can use high gains as, if offset is not a concern, if it is then use integral. And you'll see uh, I'm not going to try to, you know, bust your brains by getting really nitpicky about all of them. Um, more or less picking out the differences, okay? Uh, scan rate here changed a little bit. One second, filtering still the same. Gain of five, integrating, uh, integrating setting of about 10. So this is a little bit different. It uses Ziegler Nichols uh, for the baseline tuning parameter. So the things uh, that generally change are, are in this kind of collection of information. Search control, blah, blah, same, uh, blah, blah, same, uh, blah, blah, same. Uh, use low gains and no reset unless you want the process to return to set point slowly. slowly. If you do, use integral as well. Uh, the gain value here uh, is going to affect the buffering of the level or how much of that tank we're essentially using. Uh, scan rate more or less the same, filtering same, gain setting here you'll notice much much lower here. Uh, if, we, if you looked at this in terms of uh, proportional band uh, you'll see that it, it, it uses a lot bigger range in order to affect the controller change. Uh, our integral again about 10 using Ziegler Nichols ultimate gain for, for tuning. I understand this is a lot of information, folks, but uh, the good news is it's recorded, so you can go back and look at it again. I think this is the last process type to look at. Uh, again, distinctly different from the previous collections, three collections that we looked at. Classic steam, classic steam exchanger, uh, self-regulating process. Uh, reaction speed may be fast or slow, again, depending on the vessel size. Noise, not really an issue with temperature. Uh, what is unique and new here is a thermal well issue. Uh, temperature transmitters are, you know, always, almost always, hopefully mounted in a thermal well. Uh, the thermal well itself acts as uh, a capacity itself, right? If the oil temperature changes, not only do we have to wait for the temperature transmitter to 
detect the oil change, we have to wait that period of time for the thermal well to heat up. So it kind of acts as a little mini capacity process itself, slowing down the reaction. We need the process variable at set point, so integral is required, aka remove offset. Uh, it might be slow, so derivative may also be required. Uh, and we may want to use set point softening in order for, to prevent overshoot. Uh, and again, that is kind of uh, temperature processes. We kind of associate with reaction processes and reaction processes are generally pretty tight. You know, you're doing a, a chemical reaction. You can't be too low. You can't be too high. Uh, so there are some more considerations to, to think about. Scan rate, about the same. Filtering, about the same. Uh, here you'll see P, I, and D. This is the first one that had all three of them. Uh, we have one application that was P only, one application that's PID, and most of them were PI with the option of using D. So use reaction curve method or IMC for baseline tuning parameters. Woo! All right, other applications. There are obviously many more process types, each requiring different considerations uh, when testing and getting baseline values. Use Ziegler Nichols reaction curve, lambda, or IMC. Remember, each loop is unique, and the changes you make to one area may affect loops in other areas. That is the end, although I have three more slides. Why? Uh, quarter amplitude decay, no big deal. I don't know, it says I got three more slides, but I don't. All right, that is the end of this long and painful ILM. Uh, before you hurt your brains, I know you're going to hurt your brains, have a look at the self-test questions at the back. They will kind of give you a grounding, a grounding point in terms of how deep you really have to read into the amount of material that's presented to you. I tried to capture most of it in this PowerPoint uh, at a level that I expect you to understand. Um, but, you know, don't, don't try to hurt yourself. Have a good day.